Let me, uh, I need to grab a copy of the agenda. So I have uh, so the people that are in person are going to be writing down or somehow getting the names of the attendees uh, for Christian for the minutes. Um, I, I will I will say them out loud if that's okay because not everybody is on video. Um, are, John, are you going to are you going to connect separately? I will. Um, Do I you, need to? You don't need to. It's just that okay. if you're speaking, you're going to have to talk through. I mean, loud enough to for my laptop. To pick up. I could I could try connecting and see what happens. Okay. Uh, so. Um, do you know how to get on Wi-Fi? It's ju it's open. Just WCSU public. No. Excuse you want to sit over here a little closer? We can. Move Actually, over. I don't. You don't. Okay. <laughs> Nothing personal. COVID. All right. No, so um, maybe we could have everybody un announce themselves but who are here. It's a good idea for you to be a little bit closer. Tom oh, Fisher, Delegate East Montpelier. Did, did you guys hear that? Because then I'll be able to. Do we want to talk here? Unless you. Tom Fisher, delegate for East Montpelier. Uh, Jeremy Hansen, CV Fiber Chair. Linda Gravel, Waterbury. Jerry Diamantides, Project Manager. John Morris from Marshfield. Wendy Freinlich, Alternate Henry Middlesex. Oh, 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 hold on. Oh, 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 Henry, just the folks who are here at. <laughs> and, and that was Wendy Freundlich from, du from Duxbury. No, from Middlesex, and I'm the alternate. Middlesex, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Okay, so, um, so it's... Before you have your yes, I'm interested. Could I just read them back to make sure I got everyone? I have yeah, Jeremy... Okay. Yep, I have uh, Jeremy Hansen, Linda Gravel, uh, Jerry Diamantes, uh, John Morris, and Wendy, Fre Wendy Freudrich. And Tom Fisher. And Tom Freundly Fisher. And Tom Fisher, yes. I can I can type her name into the chat if that's I, I, I have it from the website. Thank okay. you. Wonderful. Okay. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Uh, I, I have one. I want to make a I just want to have a quick um, a quick note about um, the farmer in Tunbridge. Um, and the uh, leftover cable, and about how we might approach doing better. So um, I'm going to put that at the end. That's not a um, that's not a super pressing issue, but it is something that I want to um, I want at least I want to at least talk about. So if we need to pick this up later, we can do that as well. Okay, public comment. Is there anything um, that folks want to talk about? Oh, Siobhan and Alan? I just wanted to mention, I, I had sent this out. Somebody stood up at the select board meeting. This was not an agenda item to discuss the ARPA funding, but at the select board meeting in Orange last night, and the description from the treasurer was, let loose on, C on CV Fiber CUD and said that we were only going to be laying fiber on the main roads and we weren't going to be going up any of the side roads and that he had this information from some unnamed source at Topsham Telephone. Just wanted to put that out there that, that, that that's floating around. I'm doing damage control with the select board and the committee that's doing the planning around the ARPA funds. Well, I, I, I think the good news is that every communication that we've put out has emphasized that we're focusing on unserved and underserved. And so I, I'm not sure how anyone can go from that to main roads only. Um, um, see, Alan and, then, Alan and David. then David. So I, I wanted to report that I, I had a series of emails with somebody here in Worcester who had questions about what about people who are living off grid uh, are they going to be connected? And I know that came up during the during the online presentation, Jeremy, and you answered the question. And what I told the the fellow here in uh, Worcester was more or less what you had said as well. But I I've been thinking about this. 
do do we have any sense from any of our maps how many people are out there who are in this situation? Uh, are, is a premise that is off grid noted on our maps or does it simply not exist in the eyes of the planning maps? So I'll, I'll kick that over to David and then David, if you want to ask your question after you're done answering that. So <clears throat> I can, in Worcester especially, I can tell you where the WEC lines end and there are houses, you know, without underground, whatever. It's probably a half a dozen of them. I can tell you who they are. Yeah, I think if we know, I, I'm not sure I know a half dozen, but I certainly know probably four. Yeah. I think if we know that many, there are probably more. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out what I should be doing to pinpoint all the people who might have the same question here. Um, so I, I just wanted to bring that up because I, I think this is something that we want to pay attention to. I, I think it's a fair number of people and we don't know they're out there unless they contact us or we have personal information or knowledge of uh, off-grid people. Uh, but I, I think we should we should keep our eyes and ears open on this one. Okay, sounds good. So I, I, um, not not to sort of um, bat this back to you, but do you think that we need to we need to have a formal policy? I, I yeah, I've been thinking about that too. I think Jeremy, what you said is kind of what I was thinking, which is that we're probably going to pay for whatever distance from the last pole that they're near that we would pay to connect to connect somebody's house. And, and let's say that's, I don't know, 800 feet. Um, we will pay for the 800 feet and anything beyond that, be it, be it an extra 200 feet or an extra mile is going to be the responsibility of the homeowner. But what I don't know is whether that's a good policy in terms of the actual construction of the system. And if there's something more that I should know about or, or any of us should know about in terms of in terms of what it really means to be off grid and if there are other ways of connecting people that we might want to consider. So I, I think it's I I hate to I hate to bounce it to David, but it this might be a planning and development, at least conversation, just to sort of help us wrap our wrap our hands around what the situation is and how big the challenge is and then maybe from there we we can we can we can develop a policy as as to how this should be treated i think we very definitely should have a policy and make it consistent and stick with it and um uh be as be be as be as open-minded about trying to get people connected but realize there are some people who are really way far out there and we want to make sure we're not being asked to connect deer camps that are, you know, two miles back in the woods. So, uh, David, does that seem like a reasonable next step is for planning to yeah. do this? Maybe some, way, Jeremy. There may be some alternatives to deal with that. But my question was, oh, not my question, my comment for Siobhan was, I posted in Front Porch Forum yesterday the information on where to find the webinar and, and the slides. So actually, I need to, I did put the slides up in the Google Drive folder, and I should send that to everybody. Yeah, I'll send that. I'll send that link to the. I've already sent it to the treasurer, and I'll, I didn't think to put it on front porch forum. I'll put it there too. Thanks. Okay, Ray, and then Jeremy. <clears throat> I think I lost the thread of the conversation here with regard to off grid and on grid. And, uh, off grid. The definition of location in the statute has to do with those who are connected to the electrical system. When I hear you say off-grid, I'm hearing somebody who's not connected to the electric system. Is that correct? Because we're intending to to uh, have available uh, service to all the under and unserved. Now, there's um, we'll look at what the existing policy is around, but it's typically that if it's 400 feet or less, we pay for that, we do that, right? And if it's more than that, that the uh, person who's getting it pays for the incremental cost. And if somebody can't afford it, um, we look for programs that might assist them in making it available to them. Uh, under equal access to broadband, or if we have grants that are available that we can spend that money on, et cetera. 
Um, but this obviously has ramifications for the budget and the costs, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think, and I think that we tried to answer that question in the questions that were put to us in the operator RFP. And I think we said something like I just said. Um, so I think that's, I think that's where we're at at this point in time, but um, obviously it requires some additional work. Okay, Jeremy. Never mind. Um, anything else on this item still under uh, public comment? I'd like to just say that uh, whatever we choose is going to have to be super flexible because I think that there's going to be a lot of variety in the types of people who want to connect. From I, can't hear you. So, so, so John, uh, John Morris just said that he's, he said he thinks that we're going, there's, because there's going to be a lot of variety in the people who are off grid, we're going to have to have some flexibility about how we approach it. That there's not going to be a one size fits all. Is that a reasonable? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any anything else for uh, for this or other comments that are not on the agenda? Yeah, Tom Fisher. I'll just add in. Um, we should just be careful not to like make any promises that we can't keep. As far as you know, oh, we're going to cover a certain amount or a certain distance. We don't have firm numbers yet on that sort of thing. So be cautious as you're having your conversation. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay, anything else? All right. Um, I'm actually going to move up the discussion of Waterbury's application to join CB Fiber uh, above the consent agenda, just so that um, our friends here, should we accept Waterbury's application to join, that they will get to vote on, on everything. I do not want to leave them out if we can avoid that. So um, I did confirm with the... Um, with the chair of the Waterbury Select Board, and I have a specific request from him in email saying that they did apply, what the date was, and that they have um, uh, appointed two people, should we accept their application, to be their delegate and alternate. So I would like to move that we accept Waterbury as a member of CB Fiber. Second. 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 So Tom was next to me, so he didn't have network latency, and he, he got the second in before everybody. So that, that 60 milliseconds, Siobhan, is really going to kill you. Um, um, all right, any discussion? And so, so maybe, um, so we have both, um, both our delegate and alternate from um, Waterbury here. Um, so... Um, Linda Gravel, you are the you are the delegate, and then I see Christopher Schenk is on the screen. He is the alternate. Is that correct? Correct. All right. So where would you where would you yeah, folks? Well, sure. So hold on a second. So I'm w wondering whether we want to do introductions first, or whether we want to have the discussion of um, of next steps for this first. Do you want to have questions and then do introductions later? Okay, so I guess first question, is there any discussion? Well, well that's okay. So we want to go with discussion first. Yeah, go ahead, Alan. So I I've been I've been thinking about this more and looking at the the statute and what it requires of the of the town that wants to join and, and us as a board uh, before we make a decision. And I think the statute is written the way it is because we want to remember there are two ways that towns come into a communications union district. There were those towns that uh, I'm thinking of as forming towns. They're the ones who formed the district in the very beginning back in 2018. And we actually had to have votes in our towns at town meeting or, or Australian balloting or whatever you were using uh, in order to uh, have our town be part of this new thing called the uh, Central Vermont Communications Union District. The second way is what we're dealing with now, and it's what's laid out in the statutes under 30 VSA 3082, admission of district members. And I think of these people in contrast to, 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 to the forming members um, as um, successor members, people who did not joined at the very beginning and had a vote in, in public. Instead, they're using this part of the statutes 
in order to make application through their governing board within their municipality. And that's fine, but there are some responsibilities that, um, uh, that we have as a board that seems to me, I haven't, I don't know if we've done this. Um, the language in the statute says the board, meaning us, shall determine the financial, economic, governance, and operational effects that are likely to occur if such municipality is admitted and thereafter either grant or deny authority for admission of the petitioning municipality. If the board grants such authority, it shall also specify any terms and conditions, including financial obligations, upon which such admission is predicated. Um, so I, I, I'm reading this and I, I was trying to figure out why, why is this so different? Why is this kind of admission so different from the kind of admission that the forming members uh, got, to, got to go through in the very beginning? And I think what people must have, what legislators must have been thinking was that by the time a district is up and running and it could already be raising money, spending money, it could already be operating a system there are bound to be some areas that might have an, have an effect, uh, uh, significant or, or not so significant, on the current ongoing and planned operation of the Communications Union District. And the Communications Union District really needs to think about that before they have a new member join and they take on the obligations that we have as a public entity, as a Communications Union District, to a town in terms of providing service uh, in the area of telecommunications. So I, I, I guess what I would like to hear is what kind of determinations, if any, we've made regarding the financial, economic governance and operational effects that are likely to occur. And maybe that's going to come up during a presentation by the people from Waterbury. They'll tell us some of the some of the issues that they have and costs that that, that that might come our way. But I, you know, I really have no idea how many addresses there are in Waterbury. I don't know how many of them are unserved or underserved. I don't know if Comcast and Consolidated are, are already both operating there and Consolidated is stringing fiber. I don't know if there are any other operators. So I feel like if I were to follow what the legislature has asked us to do, I'd like to hear some answers to those questions. I, I can answer some of those questions, but I, I want to, um, I, Chuck had his hand up before, I wanna give him a chance to uh, respond. You, you go ahead. Okay. So um, I, I don't know, I don't know offhand that number of underserved folks. David, you, you had mentioned it to me previously. Do you remember offhand order of magnitude underserved folks in Waterbury, 200? Okay, there you go. 287, so which is a very small proportion of overall um, premises. Um, I did explain to, I did pass along our estimate of how much it would cost for all of the different phases of the project, the same sort of estimate that we put in the, in the presentation that, we, that I'd given previously. Um, did that estimate for Waterbury, and they know where that's at. They also know, um, they, not, um, not our friends that are joining us here today necessarily, but the select board and um, Steve Lovespeak, the uh, planning director there, they know what, the, um, what those costs are, and they also know what, they know that Waterbury is not going to be at the top of the list because we're already sort of, our train has already left the station in a pretty concrete way in that we don't have them scoped in our grant applications for the first round for pull auditing and, and such. So what I suggested, um, I've not heard back concretely, what I suggested was that if they want to get in on the, um, the pull inventory that's happening imminently, they should consider using some of the ARPA funds that they have and cover the cover Waterbury's, you know, whatever the portion of water, uh, I'm sorry, whatever the per pole cost of Waterbury would be for that inventory. Um, 
whenever we would get to that, you know, to that town. So we're kind of going in chunks of towns as we're going to talk about this later. Um, but uh, in terms of other, you know, conditions or requirements or, or anything like that, as a, as is our um, opportunity based on the statute? No, I've not. Um, I've not expressed that that was that was required. And what we said, what we all kind of came to at the last meeting was that we would kind of go, and please somebody tell me if I'm wrong, that we had sort of two different angles here. That we didn't, in principle, have any problem with them joining, but that we could not really commit to using our current grant funds to to support that, to support construction there, and we certainly wouldn't be building there super soon with any sort of high priority. Um, RD had a, um, was fairly vociferous about making sure that, that the existing towns didn't get left behind or weren't put at the end of the priority or weren't put after Waterbury. Um, just seeing if I can remember all of the commentary that were that were was brought up last month. So I don't know that that necessarily answers questions, Alan. But but I I think we have a fair bit of leeway in, in terms of how we proceed. Um, my my personal druthers, which may not be everyone else's, I recognize, are to admit them and sort out how to get them on board uh, after that. Yeah, um, to elaborate on, on a point Alan made, you know, I, I really do think the intent of that statute was to conceive of a world where our network is partially built or completely built and a new district wants to be added in or a new, a new community wants to be added into the district. And what does that do to change, you know, a lot of the high level design and, and infrastructure costs? Um, and of course, operational costs. Um, I don't believe, and I personally haven't seen it, but maybe it exists. I, I haven't seen any sort of um, uh, more detailed operating models other than you know the, the business plan figures we, we received way back in the day. So I don't know that we've even gotten to that level of detail and we've been admitted to other communities since then. Uh, so I don't know that we did that same due diligence for those other two communi communities. And my personal take on it is that, you know, now is kind of the last last call, so, so to speak, as it were, with the conditions Jeremy laid out uh, for us to be able to add someone in and not have it impact us in a huge way. Um, there could certainly be impacts, and, and I do think it would make sense for somebody to go try to figure out what those impacts are to Alan's point. Um, but, you know, I, I am quite in favor of, of them joining the district personally. So. Jeremy, then David. Yeah, so um, a couple of questions. Uh, first, we've been talking a lot about sort of the cost, you know, how much does the full inventory cost, who's going to pay for that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what about benefits? I mean, are, would it make running parts of our network easier if we could run through parts of Waterbury? So that's something else to consider. Um, and the other thing is, it sounds, Jeremy, like you've been having verbal conversations with people, um, you know, and discussing these these conditions. Um, is there any actual documentation of that in case people come back and say, hey, why are we at the back of the list? You know, and then we can point to this, you know, here's the sheet of paper, here's the email that says, you know, these are what the conditions that, you know, that we agreed to. Well, so, so I mean, if we want to set conditions on their entry, that's one thing, but my explaining of the reality of our strategic planning. Um, there is an email chain for that. I, I'm happy to to capture that and okay. share that for posterity or CYA or otherwise. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, there's not like any sort of contract or document or paper. But yeah, yeah no, that's but fine. the email chain should probably suffice in that in that respect. And uh, I'll point out that Chuck just wrote into the in the chat there that portions of Moortown and Duxbury are very 
Waterbury Village adjacent. And I, I don't know where those uh, 287 addresses are, but I'm going to go with there's a number of them that are um, rather close to the Duxbury. Uh, I can't say that. Uh, David? Okay. David? Yeah, in terms of uh, answering one of Chuck's questions, the uh, Duxbury and Washington, when they were added, we applied for CARES money and got CARES money to update the feasibility and uh, the feasibility plan. I don't think we updated the business plan, but I just want to go on record that I support adding Waterbury to the to the CUD. Any other thoughts? Happy to hear from our, our Waterbury friends if you if you are so inclined. A week ago, I saw I'm in Gravel. I live in Waterbury Center. A week ago, I saw an ad in the local uh, advertisement paper that they were looking for volunteers to, to join the CV um, Fiber group. I don't know why they didn't join at the beginning, but I was glad to see that they were looking for volunteers. Christopher and I showed up at the state um, uh, the board meeting uh, for an interview and got elected. Uh, that's basically what I know about your group at the moment and the, the history with Waterbury. You know any more, Chris? Hi, everyone. Um, no, I, I don't know much more than that, but I, I will say around the same time that I saw the same article uh, that Linda saw, um, I also I also found the um, uh, the survey that was going around by CB Fiber, and I uh, very enthusiastically filled it out myself because I've been um, personally dissatisfied with internet, but but I also recognize that it's a, a larger issue uh, that I wanted to get involved in. Um, and um, you know, recently I was the director of technology for Vital, um, which is the operator of Vermont's Health Information Exchange. So. Um, if, if any of you are aware, uh, last year we, uh, as a state, we underwent a change um, in your uh, consent status for your health information going into the health information exchange. Um, and there was a, a massive effort to, um, to share that information and, and make sure that, that every Vermonter had the information that they needed and, uh, and the ability to opt out if they so, so chose. Um, but there was a huge problem that we came that we came into, which was a significant number of Vermonters did not have access to to any internet or or high speed internet. So um, ever since then, it's been very much a um, a topic on my mind and and something that I'm passionate about. And I should point out for um, any of the new or soon to be new board members um, that I'm happy to schedule a time where we can all sit down. And I can catch you all up because that's, it's not trivial. Um, we are moving really fast right now. And where we are um, from the perspective of a board member rather than the presentation that I gave to the public is, it's a, it's a different thing, it's a different thing. Um, and I can do, give the full history and everything. One more comment. Sure. Um, I worked for Sovereign uh, Telecommunications uh, for many years uh, before I retired. I have experience in telecommunications. Um, I've also been working on the legislature uh, about getting internet all over the state. Um, county Democratic Chair, um, you folks in the county that I represent, and I think that internet is extremely important for the whole county, especially with the kids for getting school done, for bringing new families into Vermont, um, and for uh, adults who wish to work from home. So. This is a very, very important uh, issue. Hard on it already for the last two years, although whatever it didn't have me. Yet. Okay. Any any other thoughts or comments from anyone? Alan. I guess uh, if I can just circle back, I, I'm one of the things that that I've been thinking about is the fact that. I think some of our um, some of our hardest problems in where things are built first and last, and where our attention should be, 
have come in the areas where there have been r uh, rural areas that from the federal government standpoint should be served first because they're underserved. But people who live in urban mm -hmm. areas, and for us, I guess that's Montpelier and Barrie, they feel somewhat left out, I believe, and rightfully so, of the chance to be able to connect to a publicly owned and operated um, high-speed internet uh, concern that, that's probably gonna be up and running in the next few years. And they feel like they're not at the front of the line, they're kind of at the end of the line. Waterbury is another, you know, in this world of Vermont, is, is, is essentially another urban center that has different challenges for where it's at uh, with provisioning of high-speed internet services than the rural areas in the other uh, 18 or so towns in our district, if you subtract Montpelier and Barry. So I, I just, I guess as much as anything, I, I, you know, at times Ken has expressed some, some frustrations with Montpelier not uh, probably having connections built through the city soon. But I, I just want to make sure that the Waterbury folks know that they could be in the same situation where our top priority really is the rural areas, the underserved uh, and unserved. And that really is the, the policy of the ARPA money and the federal funds that have been coming out. So they're, they're going to have to accept it, that, that at this point, that's the train that's moving and moving pretty fast. And the train in the urban areas, the feds are assuming there's already, there are already providers there and most of those, for most of those premises in, in their municipalities. And so the attention that they, they will get will not be nearly as great. Ellen, Jeremy. So um, I need to step away from the meeting for uh, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I don't really have a clerk's report. Um, you know, I'm up to date on the meetings. That's about it. Um, okay. If this comes down to a roll call vote, my vote is I accept. So take that for okay. one spot. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. I'll be back in a bit. Okay. Anything else? All right, um, not, hearing, not hearing any more comments. I will take that as folks being ready to vote. Um, so maybe I, I should ask it this way. Are, are there any folks that are going to vote no or otherwise? Okay, so I will take that as unanimous consent to uh, approve Waterbury's application to join CB Fiber, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Christopher. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do, we have, do we have a quorum? Do we have a quorum? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Yes. Oh, jeez. Okay. Yeah, we're sixteen out of twenty-one now. So our, our quorum number now for 21 towns is 11. Okay, good question though, Jerry. I know I'll have to, I had to update that number in my head and I yeah, just did it. Yeah, good. Okay. All right, um, next on the agenda is the, uh, the consent agenda. So the July 13th minutes, uh, I move that we approve the consent agenda, which includes those minutes. Second. And, sorry. <laughs> Tom's here, beat you again. Um, any further discussion? Okay. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you for that. Um, financial report, Ray, you had sent something out earlier. Give us a summary. Uh, yes, I'm Mike and Lime Group. So I did send a summary out the financial report. I don't know if you have that uh, document in front of you. Let me turn to the uh, at least my view of the of that PDF file. And, and what I, I guess what I would point out at this point is this: that um, uh, our total budget for 
these items is uh, forty-five thousand dollars, and that to date we've sent we spent about seventeen thousand uh, dollars, which is a little bit more than a third, almost to forty percent of the of the total. And in July we spent uh, just over four thousand dollars, and um, and that's in the uh, executive committee approved expenditures for admin services, legal, advertising, and project management. Questions, comments? Okay, thanks for that, Ray. Um, and uh, related to the finance report, I have been checking the, the bank account every day to, uh, for when the grant money, the electric fu electronic funds transfer for the grant money should come in and it has not yet arrived. So. Everyone will know. I will be emailing with glee. Uh, all right. Clerk's report. Jeremy said he didn't really have anything, so uh, we'll move on. Project manager support. Jerry. Right. Yeah, I'll just I'll I'll just be quick by uh, touching on some categories of uh, categories of action, I guess. So there's contractor coordination. I've been up updating the contractors on the grants and the notice to proceed status. And that, that's a separate item we can talk about later, but that, that notice to proceed, I believe, is uh, hope. Shouldn't say believe is imminent. So that's contractor coordination. Then there's agency coordination. So for poll, for the uh, poll inventory area A and the non WEC high level design grant, the package, there's a grant package you have to submit that threads a certain set of needles. We threaded those needles and we were approved to move forward with that with that contract. That's for the poll inventory area A, high level design, non-WEC area. Then the, there's the a separate grant that is the WEC 3 CUD high level design, and I sent that package in today, again attempting to thread the needles of the requirements for the PSD. So that's pending approval. Um, and then there's also, uh, with age, under the heading of agency coordination, there's monthly grant reporting to PSD. So the grant reporting that was due July 30th has been submitted to PSD with no, uh, no comment from them. Then there's utility partner coordination. So we have weekly WEC coordination meetings, being that we're our partnership, we actually have a partnership with WEC, if you will. Um, and uh, I do the agenda, I attend the meetings, and I write up the notes for those, for those meetings. And what we've been working on is the poll inventory data, coordinating the receipt and the transfer of poll inventory data. Uh, we're developing an electronic poll applications with WEC so that we can, we can do this electronically instead of on their paper system. Um, we're also collaborating with WEC on the Make Ready RFP we're using their make ready experience to make sure that the RFP that we put out has, has the right information in it. And then also we have what I call the Moortown Common Road Grant. Uh, there's, there's, uh, we have 90, we have $150,000 I believe it is to, to run fiber through Moortown based on a CARES grant. And we're, we've been working with, with WEC on that because we think we have a possibility of making that happen using this grant money. So our first poll inventory effort is going to be on Moortown Common Road and the vicinities, the addresses associated with that grant. And pending the fact that we have the money and the poll uh, inventory starts there, we have a ride out with WEC tentatively scheduled for the 23rd of August to see if we can uh, almost make this a pilot project for, for all of the partnership we're doing with WEC. Plus, um, um, plus using, using this new information that we're going to get from the poll inventory data. Then with, with GMP, the other utility partner that we're coordinating with at the moment, it's a very different relationship with GMP. They, um, they already have an electronic system that, that uh, I'm going to get to, a tutorial on so that I, I can upload the information, the poll inventory, the poll application information up into their system. Uh, they, they have uh, they're very welcoming to us, and they're worth they're willing to work with us very closely. But I'm not sure that it's a partnership as much as it is a collaboration to limit the level of effort for all parties involved to get the make work, ready work done um, with GMP. And then 
the, the, uh, the other heading I, I, I split this out into is internal committee co coordination. So I coordinate with Phil on the budget and the budget reporting, for example, what was just reported now by Ray. And then I, I'm in regular daily, really, coordination. If it's not daily, I'm looking for these guys. <laughs> regular coordination with the committee chairs on just what you know what's happening what do we what do we do next what needs to be in front of what so that we can move forward so that's my update All right. any any questions for Jerry okay thanks for that um, it also occurs to me I, I, I missed something that I was ex anticipating doing I'm seeing what the water reapplication come up again on the agenda if we could do a quick round of introductions we have two new delegates from um, Middlesex and I thought that uh, if we all introduced each other and to to welcome them let them know uh, who we all are um, I mean a lot of you have tags on your on your names there on the screen but um, we'll, we'll go around and uh, just do a quick round of introductions if that's okay so um, we'll start with you Tom hi Tom Fisher uh, delegate from East Montpelier all right, so, uh, so we'll, we'll do all the folks in, on my GoToMeeting screen here first, and then the folks who are here uh, in person as well. I'm um, Jeremy Hansen. I'm the chair from Berlin. Uh, Christopher? Okay. Uh, Josh? He's muted. Yep. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yep. Uh, this is... Uh... My name is Josh Sharpless, and I am the delegate for Baritac. Thanks, Josh. Alan? Hi, my name is Alan Gilbert. I'm the delegate from Worcester. Siobhan? Uh, hi, Siobhan Perico, and I'm the delegate from Orange, and I worked at Sovereignet for two years in tech support. <laughs> David? David Healy, delegate from Canicellus. Well, and I'm also the chair of the Planning and Development Committee. And Alan's the chair of the uh, Policy Committee. Thank you. Um, and Chuck? Hi, Chuck Burt, Moortown, uh, also chair of the Communications Committee. I, I should point out that Siobhan is also the vice chair. While we're pointing out uh, alternative uh, credentials here. Uh, Jeremy is our clerk. It looks like he may still be doing, doing stuff at his, on his side. He's the delegate from Plainfield. Uh, so you're going to be, you might as well introduce yourself too, if you like. Okay, I will, I'll introduce him. Uh, Christian Myers from CVRPC he helps us with our, our minutes. He's a staffer there and we pay CVRPC to uh, for him to do that. Sorry, I'm getting some break up on my side. Didn't hear you say my name. Everything you said. Uh, that's is okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. So they are um, one of our partners. They offer us um, folks like Christian that some uh, admin support and an address. Uh, <laughs> Seth. Seth Caput's alternate and uh, was standing in for RD, but RD has actually shown up tonight. Um, let's see, uh, Henry? Hi, I'm Henry Amistadi. I'm from uh, Duxbury, and I'm very happy to welcome Waterbury uh, to CV Fiber. Thanks, Henry. Ray? Uh, Ray Pelletier, I'm Northfield Delegate and Chair of the Finance Committee. John? I'm John Morris, <laughs> and I'm delegate from Marshfield. Thanks, John. I, so because we have we have enough Johns now, I should be more specific. Now, uh, John Walters? Uh, John Walters, live in East Montpelier, not on the board. Uh, I am a member of the Communications Committee. John Russell? Uh, 
I am uh, John Russell. I'm the alternate here in uh, in Worcester. Glad to be here. Thanks, John. Katharina. Um, Katharina Mack. I'm the delegate from Washington Town. Uh, David Lawrence. Um, hi, David Lawrence from Middlesex, and uh, I'm an internet old timer. Uh, and uh, commonly online, I've been known as Tail, T A L E, and if that helps distinguish things from David Healy. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks, David. Ken? Muted? I'm sorry, I've been away for a little bit. Okay. No, so just doing a round of introductions for the new board members. Okay, so I am Ken Jones. I represent Montpelier. Thanks, and Ken. Yes, yeah, so and I look forward to working with Waterbury to understand what our organization can do with communities that are largely, largely served. But I'm not grouchy. <laughs> Today. Thanks, Ken. Tim? Hey, can you hear me okay? You sound great. Okay. Um, I've always had problems with audio here, but um, Tim Sullivan, Roxbury, uh, also Rhode Island resident, so I go back and forth. Um, camera shy tonight because I uh, just wasn't uh, in the room that I usually am in, but I uh, think we should be also um, introducing ourselves as far as how much upload and download speed we have to wherever we are. <laughs> so uh, two and a half megabytes of download speed and 0.5 upload. That's also why video doesn't work well. So, so you, you know why we don't do that, Tim, is we don't like to run our meetings and be depressed all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Sorry, so, so, I, I brought it back into light. <laughs> when, when, when we get good service to everybody, then we can start celebrating and like doing victory laps and such. Sounds good. Thanks, Tim. RD? RD, you want to you take it? You're muted. I'm R.D. Eno from Cabot, and I'm and I welcome um, Seth O'Brien, my alternate, a lot smarter than I am, and uh, and I'm just imagining how quickly these meetings are going to go once we all have great connections. You, you and me both, my friends. All right, so so we, we kind of did some introductions already, but we'll 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 do this again if you don't mind. I'm Linda Gravel. I'm from Waterbury. Okay. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Jerry Diamantides. I'm the project manager and independent contractor, formerly delegate, uh, alternate delegate from Berlin, formerly treasurer. He's worn a lot of hats. Your mic's on. Okay, I'm Wendy Freinlich, and I am the alternate delegate from Middlesex, and I'm ready to kill consolidated. <laughs> kill them. That is a great way to end, I think, um, the, the run of introductions. Thanks, Wendy. Um, we'll have a nice, long, good conversation ca catching you up with all that. All right, um, July 28th presentation update. So I gave that presentation, we had about 40 people attending. Um, I thought it went pretty well. Um, I ended up giving the same presentation again um, a little bit later to East Montpelier and it was to the select board there and they appreciated that as well. Um, it's been uploaded so folks can watch it. The slides are out there. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions or any other Anything else that we need to be talking about with regard to that? Um, I just thought I'd catch you up there, David. Muted. Would you recommend that we all present our own version of this to the other the blackboard? Can you, can you say that again? I'm sorry, I have the audio off on my machine here. I, do you think it'd be a good idea if we all gave individual presentations to our select boards? 
Um, given the attitudes, the attitudes that came out of that meeting, I certainly can't see how it would. Hurt. Um, they were they were very excited. I mean, they liked having all of their questions answered. Um, different select board members wanted to know different levels of detail. So I mean, there were a lot of questions about specifically about poles and conduit and uh, uh, logistics. So I mean, if you're not comfortable doing that presentation, I have a, a, a bit of time between now and the end of August, if you wanted to schedule me for your select board or city council or what have you, I can I can do that. But yes, I would say take that presentation and uh, and present away. Um, okay. So um, we have prepared presentations for individuals who are going before their select boards, and in particular looking for opera funds. And uh, we've done that, um, I think, for um, John Morris, and for several other folks and we're, we're happy to do that it's more your town specific and so if you if you are planning to do something like that let, let me know and we will do something specifically for you uh, until you're happy with it yeah so in particular we can um we by, by we i mean david can generate a map um and we can then you know, plug in the numbers and get the sense of uh, how much um, how much money are coming from the ARPA funds and how much you know each of the. We don't have to plug anything, and we just take that take that part out of the bigger presentation and look at how much each town or city um, would cost to build out in its entirety. Uh, anything else that we need to do moving forward with this presentations or anything? We we have an agenda item for the uh, executive committee on. Thursday to talk more about uh, ARPA funds in towns. Uh, but if anybody has anything um, to talk about, I don't have a specific item on the agenda for tonight. Joe. Yeah. Did you, did you, um, did you, you, you unmute, Ken? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that we, we tried to have the, the select board meeting in Marshfield. Uh, and Jeremy came out for that. And then it turned out they had uh, quorum issues and we didn't have a meeting. Um, and I was wondering, if Jeremy, if you connected with him about the next meeting, are you going to be able to do that? Yeah, uh, good question. So I have, uh, I'm on the agenda for uh, next week, the 17th. They will be catching up there. They had select board members that were sick, but I will be, yes, I will be going to Marshfield. I will be giving the presentation there. Um, but we already prepared the presentation. So I don't think I actually have the slide. So if uh, Ray or John, if you can send that to me, that would be helpful. Um, but at least, I mean, they at least seemed um, interested in what we we're doing, and it's and it seems like they would be willing to part with at least some of the municipal ARPA funds that they're getting. All right. Anything else on this? All right. Moving along, um, Microsoft Tools update. This is yours, Chuck. All right, well, I am happy to report that we finally were able to successfully purchase uh, the Microsoft email and, and tools, um, the office tools. Uh, it only took eight weeks to uh, provision through the state's supplier, fun times. Um, we have a couple of things we need to address before we can roll it out more broadly, uh, but look for further details to come in the very near future uh, as we start to provision accounts for each person um, and start to set up uh, the document sharing. Um, worth noting, if you are doing a lot of document collaboration and you're going to want the desktop downloaded applications and not just to use the web interface, it does require a more expensive tier of license. Um, and in order to get that, uh, our current process is that you will request such access from the executive committee and the executive committee would approve that uh, up to the amount that has already been pre-approved by the board for it to spend, of course. And we do have some, some wiggle room already baked in there. Uh, if we were to go above that, we would have to bring it back to the board for, for board consideration. Um, any uh, questions on that topic? And thank you to those of you who have helped become guinea pigs um, investing for me. So, thank you. All right, so uh, Tom and I needed to switch spots, so I'm feeding the, the, the display here now, so bear, bear with me as I 
shift over a bit. I don't need to put this. Okay, can you still all hear me okay? Yep. Great. Yes. Glad to hear it. So I'm going to do this. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, any questions for any questions for Chuck? I see Jeremy um, Matt's hand what, up. Jeremy, I have glare right on your face. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so I just wanted to say that I got the uh, oh man, it's my heck of an echo. Uh, do you mind muting Jeremy? I think it might be yeah, go for yours. It. Is that better? No, I can't hear you, but I don't hear echo, so that works. Um, I just wanted to say that I do have um, multiple Microsoft accounts now set up on my computer. And it's pretty straightforward to do that, um, both email and a couple of different one uh, OneDrive accounts or whatever they're called. And uh, so if anyone would like help getting those set up, let me know. One piece, if you want to do it yourself, make sure to tell it not to back up anything by default, and I didn't catch this, by default, it tried to back up my desktop, my documents, and my pictures, and move the, physically on my computer, physically move those files from their original location in my user directory, copied them into the OneDrive thing, and then started uploading them to CV Fiber's account, which is not quite what I wanted done. <laughs> so, Anyway, that's just a heads up that uh, don't do what I did and uh, let me know if you want any help. All right, thanks for that, Jeremy. Go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, um, just one caveat there. While the apps of OneDrive, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and, and Outlook all do support multiple Microsoft accounts very seamlessly, uh, the one app that does not support multiple accounts very seamlessly is Teams. Uh, if you are already on a Teams business account and you use it, um, you will have to kind of log out and log back in and switch between that uh, because for whatever reason, they've made the decision to have Teams only support one uh, enterprise Microsoft account at a time, uh, or you can add on one additional personal Microsoft account, uh, it, sort of inexplicably, I'm sure there was some design decision to go into that, but um, that is going to be the one major gotcha, I think, if any of you do actively use Teams for, for work. So, Jeremy, was that a hand up or you were just uh, indicating that that's your situation? That's my situation. I use that a lot for UVM. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll you will be the uh, you'll be the one case that had the OneDrive issues, and everybody's going to not make that same mistake. Then let's let's hope. Okay, so we are right on time. Let's move on to the uh, Vermont Community Broadband Board. Uh, even though they've only been in existence or constituted for less than a week, they've already had two meetings: one last week, one this morning. Um, and they are off to the races, for better or for worse. Um, I don't remember when they're going to meet again. I think they're going to probably meet informally, and they may have another meeting next week. But um, all the CUDs got to present this morning uh, about where we are, where we're going. They had a long conversation about what they're... I'm going to back up a little bit. I, for some of you, you may remember what it was like being at the first few CV Fiber meetings. Um, or before we really understood how we worked as a body. And that's how the VCBB meeting is, meetings have been going, except they're all in a kind of a, it, it's a, it's a much smaller board, 
and everybody wants to talk all at once. Um, there's a lot of ideas and there's a lot of stuff going on and folks are very motivated to, to do stuff. Um, the recordings of the board are online. Um, they don't have a web page of their own yet. Um, I guess I, I don't know really what else specifically to add that you couldn't glean from their, their minutes or, or whatnot, but they are hopefully going to be putting forth some um, a grant RFP for the H360, I guess what, Act 71 funds uh, for pre-construction and such soon. That's the, uh, that's the rumor. Siobhan? Are they subject to the public meeting law? Oh, yeah. Yay! <laughs> yeah, so, so they will, um, you can show up for their meetings. Um, you can, they do have to post their, um, they have to post their agendas and their minutes and all of the same stuff that we have to go through, they're abiding by uh, as well. Yeah, garlic sauce? No, Henry, mute. <laughs> all right. Um, I just had a, a question. Is there a way to get on that list um, of the meetings? That's a that's a good question. I would check the um, hmm. I would check the De Department of Public Services site for right right now. That'd be my guess. Um, otherwise, if you send Rob Fish Robert dot Fish at vermont.gov, send him an email. And he can put you on that list for sure. There's, there's probably. Yeah, I, I got um, on the first meeting, but I didn't get the notice for the second meeting. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, anything else? The folk, maybe any of the folks who watched one or the other or both of the, the board's meetings. Anything else you want to add, or anything else we should uh, note for? all of our folks here tonight. Okay. Today was a, it was a long meeting today. It was really long. Um, they had an agenda that was probably two or three times the amount of time they could reasonably get through today. So they will continue plodding along. Okay. Um, grants update. Who wants to take this one? Well, Jerry, you gave a bit of this before. Do you want to uh, do you want to talk more about it? I mean, I, I don't know that we have too much more to say. Uh, yeah, I can I can go through it pretty quickly unless David prefers. David, do you prefer to do it? No, uh, you're you're on mute, so I, I guess I you guess can take it, Jerry. Okay, so so we have uh, we're 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 moving forward. It seems on. Two of the CARES grants that we, that, well, it's the one CARE grant, but the two programs within the CARES grant that we haven't had any, hadn't gotten any traction before. So there's Northbury, Northfield Roxbury, that we're starting to get traction now with, with EC Fiber. And then there's the Moore Town that I discussed before. So it's, it, you know, we were very concerned about it getting too late in the year, but it looks like we might be able to, to bring these home. So that would, that would be, that, that's very positive. And then, as I said before, we, we, we have sent in our request. Our first invoice has been sent in for two grants: the the, the one grant that's the pole inventory and the non-WEC high-level design, and also for the this package that I submitted today, which is the three CUD um, three CUD WEC territory uh, grant. So that so we've asked for our first funds for those. Um, and then, as Jeremy said, we are positioning ourselves to respond to the request for proposals or put out the application, if you will, for, for the next round that in, that's going to include air, uh, poll inventories for areas B and C, as well as uh, a detailed design um, and potentially some, some money for uh, make ready. So we're, uh, we're poised to answer that when it, when it comes down, down the pipe to us. I think that covers it for now. Ray, David, did I miss anything? I think you got it all. Okay, any questions? Oh, Tom has a question. <laughs> um, 
I hear the uh, infrastructure uh, bill came out of the Senate and is headed to the House from the federal level. And does, do we have any idea what that might entail as far as how it would pour down to us? So, um, as, as I understand it, it's, um, I think Vermont is looking at $100 million because it was, it was divided up a certain way, but there was a, a state minimum, which is the sort, which is, I think, that's got Pat Leahy's fingerprints on it, um, to essentially say, we would have gotten a much smaller cut had that minimum not been in there. So definitely um, kudos to Senator Leahy for, for that one. Um, so back of the napkin, you know, we're looking at, you know, a ninth of that roughly. I mean, it's the, the, the formula that they're going to use is different, but whatever, because we're one of nine CUDs. And then again, the state maybe spends that on state infrastructure. I, I, I don't know. Um, but we're talking about in the, in the millions. It's, I mean, I, if the House doesn't do anything with it, that is. <laughs> Which I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't wait, make any wagers one way or the other. Um, any other thoughts or questions about grants, um, past, present, or future? All right. Very good. So let's uh, let's keep it rolling then. Um, RFP, RFB, and contracting updates. Um, Ray, you wanted to put this on here. Um, sure. There are some other folks that that may want to give uh, some updates or have questions about this too. Yeah, so and David David can jump in as well. So for RFPs, um, the WEC high level design is awaiting state review. Uh, David probably has more to say about that. Uh, the non WEC high level design detail design is also awaiting state review as part of the, the process. Um, there's a WEC detail design uh, RFP that's under discussion and um, we'll see how when that pops out uh, but that's likely to be uh, also a cd fiber initiative in terms of um, uh, issuing the rfp for re for requests for bids we uh, have um, in the works the areas b and c poll inventory request for bids uh, should be issued this week to the three contractors uh, with the view that three weeks or so from now we'll have proposals that we can uh, make some recommendations with regard to who's going to be getting what work, uh, when, of course, has to do with um, uh, the funding streams. David, do you want to add anything or subtract anything to those? No, I got to the uh, updates on the RFP for operator that we put out several weeks ago. We got request. Uh, we got questions from three different firms. The team produced. A response and thank you everybody uh, we ended up with 41 questions that were not duplicative and um, they are now on the website and I don't know how many proposals we anticipate hearing I know the three firms that asked for questions or two of them anyway I know we're going to propose and then I, the um, the rumor has it that the firms that are bidding on Northeast Kingdom Fiber and Maple Broadband, they're probably bidding on our job too. Um, in terms of contracting, we, I think we're pretty close to a negotiated contract with um, Vantage Point for the high level design with WEC and, and CV Fiber and the detailed design for CV Fiber. And we'd be taking them up at the executive committee on Thursday night. I sent copies of them to everybody today. I probably should have put it on the Google Drive, then we don't have to be cluttering each other's emails, sorry. But that's my update. Actually, you could put it in the, in the Microsoft shared <laughs> repository as we migrate over to that. As soon as, 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 as that gives us a, a subdirectory structure, right, Chuck? <laughs> oh, God, I, I, I don't envy that. <laughs> Any um, any other questions or updates that we ought to have? Um, anything else about RFPs, RFPs, or contracts? Gary, I think you covered most of your stuff previously. Oh, Chuck? Are, are we voting on that contract tonight, or is that just in exec? Yeah, we voted last month to uh, move forward, so we did vote. So it's okay. exec. I, I do have some feedback on that contract that I'll send your way. Okay. All right, thank you.
All right. Anything else? All right. Very good. Um, town outreach update. Um, we kind of covered this a little bit before, and I realized that my, um, in my haste to get the um, agenda out, my my times are all screwy. It's funny. Um, good stuff, because I because I went from seven twenty to six thirty five. That's exciting. I've done that before. Yeah. Oh, oh, time I, say, I feel a little bit like Michael J. Fox and just looking for my flux capacitor. Anyways, um, town outreach. Um, so I think we gave a, uh, we, we talked a little bit about East Montpelier and uh, we'll be presenting to Marshfield. Um, I sent letters, physical letters, dead tree letters to all of the towns and cities asking for their feedback on hub locations. Um, I should probably send one of those to Waterbury now too. Um, the idea there is that for those of you that are um, you know, just joining us, um, the statute provides that each member municipality should provide for lease some space for equipment. And, the, um, and so we essentially explain in the letter what it is that we're looking for and as we're doing the high level design and as we're gonna get to do some more of the detailed design for the network, we need to know where are we putting some of these like core networking components and can we put them on public property wherever that might be, wherever the select board or city council would be amenable to that. Um, I'm confident that in sending the blast out to 20 towns, cities, we'll find something. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Uh, anything else on town outreach that we ought to be talking about? David? I think, I mean, we have historically talked about the money, opera money from towns, but the county money is now officially going to the towns, so they have a lot more money than we originally put in that table. And I think Ray has sent out that table to everybody, so we should know every town, every member here should know how much money that town has. Um, and it, it will involve follow, following up and staying on top of whether towns are interested in, in contributing to what we're doing. Yeah, and the, 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 the Vermont League of Cities and Towns actually got some um, got some funding to coordinate and help towns as they're kind of navigating the process of great that we have this money in, in our bank account now, and that, that money landed in bank accounts within the last couple of days. Um, how do they spend it and still follow the federal regs? And that's essentially what we're, we're trying to navigate with the memorandum of understanding with the towns that are interested in um, turning over some of that money to us. So we're still, still go, going through the process. There's some, some legal issues to still resolve there. Okay, uh, anything else on town outreach? Okay, uh, auditor RFP. So uh, thanks, Jeremy. So I've, uh, I sent out earlier uh, an email with the proposed motion to uh, issue an RFP for an auditor. And in the in the chat room, I've uh, put the motion there for you. There are three whereas uh, clauses and then the motion is hereby moved the governing board request the finance committee to draft the executive committee to refine issue and publicize request for proposals for an accounting contractor to conduct the required single audit for 2021. Second. <laughs> the motion is patterned off to the motion, the motion that was approved by the board for uh, accounting, uh, an accounting firm. Uh, so it, it should look familiar to you. Happy to answer any questions. Um, Jerry has a friendly amendment he would like to propose. Could we, could we also add to that that the, the, the single audit is one very special type of audit, but I think it may well be possible that we will also have to uh, do some other audits. There may be some standard financial audits that are required if we want to have three years of audited books to go forward for a, uh, to, to, to go into the private market for funds or the state may require us to do an audit. Um, so is, is, there, is there possibly a way to 
to add something uh, something like and any other audits as may be required in fit for fiscal year, you know, to do it for this fiscal year or something along those lines. Sorry, I didn't get this to you earlier, Ray. That doesn't sound very friendly, Jerry. <laughs> so I've uh, added some language in the bottom, the, the Jerry Amendment, and that would be, uh, and such other audits as may be required thereafter. What I said, thank you. All right. So, uh, Siobhan, you're the second. Is that uh, amenable? Yep, 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 yep. Wonderful. Amen amenable means amended. Um, all right. So anything else with this motion for the auditor RFP to get that process rolling? That is on the agenda for the Thursday executive committee meeting as well. I should point that out. Um, not hearing anything. Are there any objections to the motion as amended? So friendly, friendly or whatever, whatever. Amenably. Amenably. There you go. So amenably amended. Okay. Not hearing any. The motion passes unanimously. Thanks, Ray. Make ready RFP. So I also sent out a motion, a uh, proposed motion earlier with regard to make ready services. <clears throat> and um, under, under the regulations and under federal re regulations as well, um, those who were looking to attach items to polls uh, may, when the poll owner does not, or uh, either unwilling or not willing to do it in a timely fashion, may engage contractors to do it for them. We've had some really good conversations with WEC with regard to um, Make Ready and what their resources are capable of doing. And they're amenable to our, to our going forward with uh, getting, retaining contractors to Make Ready work. Uh, they will be part of the process when we review qualifications for make ready contractors. Uh, they're required actually under the regulations to post those contractors that they uh, are willing to uh, have do work. Uh, Green Mountain Power, we're also in discussions with them. Uh, the motion is, it is hereby moved the governing board authorize the issuance of requests for proposals for make ready services and further authorize the executive committee to take such actions as necessary to refine issue and publicize an RFP as needed, as well as the grant application timing and amount in support thereof. Second. Happy to take any questions. All right, any, any questions for Ray about the make ready? Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so are there any objections to approving this motion? The motion passes unanimously. Uh, again, on the agenda for the executive committee meeting to get more into the into the, the weeds on that one if you need to. So if you have uh, suggestions or anything is, after you've reviewed that, please uh, send them on over to uh, whomever. Um, okay, um, we have a... Um, so we would normally go to roundtable, but I, I wanted to add a, a quick discussion of the, uh, the news story you all must have seen, the farmer in Tunbridge who is at risk of losing uh, quite a number of dairy, well, uh, losing almost their entire herd of dairy cattle due to uh, a subcontractor of Eustis leaving out a whole bunch of um, leftover cable that got um, chopped up and mulched while they were haying and is uh, killing a whole bunch of cows and is not clear that they will be able to financially recover. Um, and this was, this will probably be litigated. Um, Eustace did the right thing and said that's awful and then bought a whole bunch of replacement feed because they had to throw the whole, um, the whole field full of hay away they had to get they had to get rid of it throw it and throw it somewhere where cows weren't going to eat it um, that said um, there's a lot of folks who are looking at the work that's that's happening imminently in the state of Vermont and saying I don't want that to happen to my farm so like 
Our East Montpelier Select Board Chair is a dairy farmer, and I would hate to see us doing work in East Montpelier, say, like imminently, and then a contractor leaving a whole bunch of material um, nearby, and that gets mulched and it kills Seth's cows. Um, I'm, I'm gonna put it out there right now, not on my watch. Um, so we need to take some affirmative steps to make sure that our, um, our contracts with contractors have specific language about cleanup. And I think this is what the, uh, the campground rule, you know, leave it, leave it better than you found it. So we have to have something in there that will have um, expectations that are clear that say, if you're bringing material with you to a construction site, any scraps, any bits, any pieces that you bring in, you take back out. Um, I don't see this as particularly controversial uh, at this point, frankly. Um, but I guess I would ask uh, Alan as the policy committee chair, do you feel the need that we should draft a policy or do you think that we can just say to our contractors when we get that far that we ought to, you know, that they ought to include something like that? Or do we hire a lawyer at this point and say we need to hire a lawyer to write that, write that little tidbit of language that will then go into our, all of our future contracts? Because this is something that we, we must address. So Alan and then Jeremy and then John. Yeah, I, I would suggest, if this is okay with Ray, that Ray and I have a conversation first. You know, Ray's pretty good about contracts, and I think this probably is a question of getting good, solid contractual language into the uh, contracts that we make. And that might require uh, a practicing attorney to review for us, but Ray and I can talk about that. Is that okay, Ray? Does that sound like a plan? Okay, great. All right, thanks for that, Alan. Um, I've got Jeremy and then John Morris. Yeah, I, I agree that this is really, really important that we need to get right. Um, a little bit more background. Uh, part of the problem was that it was stainless material, which is non-magnetic. They have protections for like, say a piece of barbed wire cat gets in, they've got magnets that will pull out the magnetic material, but it doesn't catch the stainless. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I do think that it would be a good idea to have a policy in place or some contract language that we can point to. You know, some some farmer says, hey, you're going to be running through my land. I don't think I want that. You know, what what guarantees do I have? And then we can say, like, look, here we put in our contracts X, Y, Z that, you know, if there are any problems, you know, that result in you know damage or deaths to animals or whatever that the contractor is 100% liable for all costs or something like that. You know, I don't know how to structure that, but I think it should, I think something like that should be in there. Fair enough. John Morris? Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I think no matter what kind of language we put in there, there's going to have to be some liability insurance. And I don't know if that's because if that's going to be covered by the contractor buying some liability insurance or, or CV fiber owning some liability insurance, but it's going to have to be an awful lot of insurance. Uh, I don't think a, a regular $1 million policy is going to be enough to do that kind of liability coverage. Okay. Yeah, all of our contracts have a section on liability and we're not assuming liability for the work that our contractors are doing. Um, we'll put language in there having to do with uh, the issue, the particular issue that we're talking about. And perhaps uh, that might be a little bit broader than, uh, broader than that. Um, I'm reluctant to kind of adopting policies, kind of ad hoc policies as we go. Uh, one of the things when you do that is that you become liable for upholding your policies. And um, uh, so be careful what you write and adopt. Sure. Uh, an attorney's review is in order for this. 
a policy is in order for this so that um, it's known where we stand on this. This is an important issue. Thanks, Linda. Any anything else? Um, anything else on this yet, yeah, John? Morris? Uh, I come on, wake up. There we go. Uh, I just like to respond to Ray and say that whether or not we adopt, uh, whether we accept liability, or whether we say that the contractor is liable. If there isn't insurance, then the, the contractor may or may not be around to, to cover that liability in the future. And, and that's why I'm, I'm suggesting that, that no matter what happens, there has to be some kind of insurance that, that can cover it if the, the liable policy can't. Our contracts typically also have the insurance section in them, so. I'd, I'd also just throw in that, I mean, the, the idea here is we'd like to avoid it, not just cover it when it does happen. Um, so making sure that we elevate it to at least a speaking level to our contractors of saying, you know, not only did you submit this in writing, but hey, by the way, we don't want you tarnishing our reputation in the state by, you know, having something like this happen. Okay, one more point then, since... Jeremy, sure, I mean, would you repeat some you, of that? Because it wasn't clear what Tom just said. Yep. Would, would you say it again, Tom? So saying, uh, it's, it's important that we not only write this down in a contract or in policy, but that we actually state this to the contractor and make it clear that, you know, it's our, uh, uh, you know, how, the, how the state's going to view us is a major part of this, and we want it to, uh, you know, be prevented, not just be covered in case it does happen. And then uh, Jerry had something to add. Yeah, I just, want to, I just wanted to follow up that e even with the poll inventory contractors that we've already had contact with, um, we've told them that, you know, they're the face of CV Fiber in the community and that we're community-based and we had a long discussion about the, the need to be a, the, the way we are a part of the community and the way we're we want to monitor the behavior, if you will, of the contractors in the field. That's very important to us. Definitely agree. So you know, as we're having conversations with contractors, primarily with folks that are going to be out in the field, um, these are things that we need to, we need to take um, affirmative steps ahead of time, in addition to the CYA legal process that happens um, that will cover things if they do happen. Yeah, it's m much cheaper for everybody if it just doesn't happen in the first place. So I think if we can just say, hey, pick up your crap, and that's just our position, um, I think it'll be, be better for everybody. Okay, so um, this is the point in the meeting where because we are done with our agenda items where everybody gets a, um, um, gets the opportunity, to, oh, I'm sorry, I was gonna go to round table and exp I'll explain round table in a sec, but I see RD has his hand up. Go ahead, RD. I hope you can catch some of this. My de my upload is about zero. Um, but um, the people we need to be in conversation with are not <clears throat> just our contractors, but the landowners on whose land the contractors are going to be uh, are going to be going to do their work. Notif giving prior notification to property some of these poles are located but i think it's an important consideration having the magnetic logos on each side of the truck may not prove sufficient um, and can do much to enlist public trust if we do do as much outreach and prior notification as is possible All right, thanks, R.D. Uh, one, of, one of the things that we're doing, um, just to address that, and then I see Siobhan, you have your hand up. One of the things that we're doing to try to um, get the word out there about at least some of the, the stuff that we're doing for poll inventories is that Washington Electric Co-op is um, publishing information about uh, our contractors working in working and looking at those polls. Um, they're communicating that to their 
members and they're communicating that through their website and they're communicating that they'll be will be communicating that through their current newspaper um uh so not to call you out too much chuck on this but i didn't don't know did you get any copy or do you have any talks with folks at WEC about um some copy or a landing page that they could uh advertise uh, yeah, that that is in process and is going to be one of the topics for discussion at next Thursday's communications regular meeting. Um, but we we do all have Jerry actually working on composing some of that for us at this point. So thank you, Jerry, for your work on that. Um, and I would just call out that you know having done a lot in the realm of communications, trying to do personalized outreach here is just not something we are equipped to really handle. There are a lot of farmers in our district. Um, you know, if, if you're concerned, I would encourage you to try to talk to some of the farmers in your community directly. Uh, but doing that level of a personalization campaign is, is going to be very difficult for us to pull off effectively. So I think we are just going to have to do a lot of over communicating at the district level and in our front porch forums and in any sort of channel like that where, where we, can, uh, we can blast out announcements. And if, if folks have other suggestions for how we might do this, you know, other places where we might communicate that are, it's going to be um, efficient uses of our time and our resources, um, I would love to. I would love to hear that because I, I think I think the more people know, a the more excited that they're going to be, but then the the fewer surprises that folks are going to have. Um, down the road, hopefully. So if they see a CV fiber car or truck, they're gonna they're going to look at it and say, "Oh, I remember hearing about that because you know uh, Henry posted on Duxbury's front porch forum, and everybody's comfortable with uh, you know with what's going on." So um, and this this may also be the you know one of the the benefits of reaching out and presenting to select boards and city councils so that they understand that this is imminent and there's gonna be people walking around, um, at least uh, in some communities soon, very soon. Anything else on the um, farmer concerns, cable, contracting, outreach? Oh, I'm sorry, and Siobhan, I'm sorry, let's come back. Uh, that's okay. I. I know this is sentimental of me, but I think of them as our cows. This isn't just about liability. These are our cows and these are our, our friends cows. And, and I was so distressed when I heard how several of them passed. It was very upsetting. So, you know, I think we need to, you know, we're not just conveying the legal, certainly the legal stuff is absolutely necessary because the contractors are not going to be thinking these are our cows, but I think we need to recognize and and convey the message that we understand these are not just you know a monetary vehicle for people. These are people's family in a lot of cases. Their cows are their family in, in a certain degrees, um, and it's just it, there's it's, there's there's a there's a heart. To this as well i guess is what i'm trying to say there i'll stop thanks siobhan so as I, when this meeting is done i recommend you you should go hug a cow it'll make you feel better um rd RD, whenever you're ready. Looks like he might be doing the chat instead. Okay, it looks like he's typing something into the chat instead. And so I, I will offer um, a cow hug by proxy if anybody would like me to. Um, there are cows right outside my front door, so it's easy for me to do so. They're very nice. Um, Okay, so um, we will be doing a roundtable now. So this is our each of our opportunities to have um, you know one last word to mention anything that you might want to mention, things that are going on in your community, things that you thought about um, 
the meeting, anything um, that you want to share with the rest of us. Sometimes this is sort of a, you know, a group pat on the back and such, or, or not. Um, but let's, um, yeah, let's go down. Uh, we'll start with um, one of our new folks, uh, Christopher Schenk. Anything to add that you'd like to share as we're wrapping up? Uh, no, I'm just very happy to be here. Thank you for including me. And thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Josh? You frozen? I couldn't hear anything you said, Jeremy. Were you talking? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Josh Jarvis. Um, I have nothing more to add. Just uh, want to thank everybody for all the hard work that's been going in. Good to see the future. Thanks, Josh. Alan. Okay, Siobhan? I'm fine. No, I'm good. Thanks. David? I'm good. Chuck? Thank you, everyone, for all the hard work. Thanks, Chuck. Jeremy? I think our new motto should be, let's go hug cows together. I could really get behind that and tip it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Henry? I just want to say uh, everyone's doing a great job. I can't believe how much work is being done. Uh, I think at this point you know what my skills are. If you need any help, let me know. Um, my takeaway from earlier conversations was was that we're, we should proceed with sending out the PowerPoint to front porch forum and et cetera. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's what I would do. And then the last thing is that I would like to uh, work with whoever to prepare for um, approaching the Duxbury Select Board. Uh, with an ARPA um, informational session. Okay. And again, Sorry. thanks, everybody. Thanks again, everybody, for all the hard work. And uh, let me know if I can help you out. Sounds good. Yeah, Henry, let me know when the Duxbury um, Select Board meeting is. I'm happy to come out and do that if it's in the next few weeks. Well, right? I, I want to get the proposal um, ready first. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so the way that we've done it previously is we've presented and then that the, pr the presentation kind of has the proposal and the pitch and then we send over the MOU beforehand because they will invariably have questions like that. And so there are still some legal issues that we need to work out and that we'll hopefully be sorting that out in the next, um, well, I would say this week, frankly. Yeah, that sounds good. I, I guess for me, the first step is uh, customizing the presentation for Duxbury, getting that under our belts, and then approaching the select board after that, and also the uh, agreement as you spoke. Uh, but the first step is to put together the modified proposal and feel good about that and, and, and then go on from there. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, let's let's connect on that, and we'll uh, we'll figure out what's next. Right. Great job, everybody. Uh, I'm fine. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. Uh, John Walters. Uh, nope. I'm I'm good. Thanks, John. John Morris. I have nothing to add. Thanks, John. David Lawrence? Nope, nothing for me. Thanks, David. RD? 
Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, RD. Uh, Tom? First, I'm not sure if I'm more excited to get uh, fiber to my own premises or to RD's premise. I <laughs> will <laughs> <laughs> second that. I also want to say uh, I, I highly recommend reaching out to your select board. Uh, it was a very successful event. And thank you formally to um, Jeremy for, for leading that uh, presentation because it was great for them. Um, it was lucrative for us. Um, and uh, it was just a really a good experience. So I highly recommend if you haven't done that yet, to at least reach out and start the process because it was not that big a lift and it got us pretty far. So. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Linda? I see the work that's being done here is extremely important for Vermont. I want to thank everyone for their hard work. I certainly have a lot to come up to speed on and I'm hoping that Jeremy will help us with that. Thank you. Definitely. Thanks, Linda. Jerry? Nothing to add. Okay. Wendy? Sean can connect you there. Yep. Just thank you for all your hard work and uh, that's it. Okay. okay. Well, I think that is the end. Uh, I will declare us adjourned then at 7.47 p.m. and we can fly out of here. Have a nice night, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Jeremy, before we...